Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, we again present Voices from Japan, an interview with Laura and Gichi Inoue, who run Komuro Homestay, a support organization that allows women and children of Fukushima to get some time away from their home city. That interview, plus Numbnuts of the Week, and all the news will be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, June 10, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. First, breaking this profoundly sad story that the first death has been counted among the sailors from the USS Ronald Reagan, who got hit with massive radiation while on an humanitarian aid mission to Fukushima in Japan immediately after the earthquake and tsunami. Theodore H. Holcomb, an aviation mechanic structural petty officer second class, who was assisting in Operation Tomodachi, died on April 24, 2014, of synovial sarcoma, a rare form of inoperable cancer. Holcomb was aboard the USS Reagan when it sailed into the radiation plume released by TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility in the days immediately following the March 11, 2011 earthquake and tsunami. He began having breathing problems while still in the service and was subsequently discharged with breathing problems, pain in his right shoulder, and an excessive heart rate. He was diagnosed with cancer just before New Year's 2012. It was located next to his heart and causing both lung and heart issues. Research on the Internet revealed that this form of cancer only occurs in 0.001% of the population under 60 years of age. Holcomb was 38 years old. He is survived by his five-year-old daughter. Holcomb was part of the class action suit filed against TEPCO by sailors of the USS Reagan for failing to inform them of the danger into which they were sailing. TEPCO has filed for the case to be dismissed, and a hearing has been scheduled for July 12, 2014, in federal court in San Diego. Mark that date, July 12. As I learn what can be done to support the sailors at that time, I'll let you know. And all things being equal, I will be there to cover the story for Nuclear Hot Seat. Now it's time for the NRC Duck! <laughs> And cover report. Only this time, it's the NRC that needs to be ducking and covering. Senator Barbara Boxer, chairwoman of the Environment and Public Works Committee, has demanded that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission cough up documents revealing details about precisely how San Onofre's nearly new $1 billion steam generators were poorly designed and failed to work as necessary. Boxer is asking what role the NRC's regulation, or lack thereof, played in the fiasco. The NRC's stance is that it doesn't have to give her everything, and reminded her that the NRC is an independent regulatory agency, and that separation of powers concerns, that's a great phrase from them, separation of powers concerns protected against forced disclosure of certain documents to ensure that there's not even a potential appearance of the NRC being bullied by Congress and its political whims. To which Boxer, in her best bullying political stance, dropped her own little bomb with a public release of a legal analysis that says that the NRC and its rationale for withholding information is to use a technical phrase, bogus. Morris Rosenberg, a legislative consultant with 35 years in the American Law Division of the Congressional Research Service, said, These refusals to comply have been accompanied by constitutional and other legal justifications that are highly problematic and unsupported by accepted law and practice. He went on to say, The NRC chairman, sick, 
demonstrates a profound misunderstanding of the plenary, a legal term meaning unqualified or absolute, nature of Congress's investigatory power in the circumstances prevalent in the San Onofre matter, misstates the authority of three cited cases dealing with the law on congressional intercession, and shows a lack of awareness of over 90 years of congressional investigations in which agencies have been consistently obliged to provide documents and testimony. In the present circumstances, Rosenberg wrote, there is no question of constitutional power allocation. The NRC is a creation of the Congress which alone is responsible for its mission, authority, and funding and is subject to Congress's plenary, meaning absolute, oversight power to determine how well it is performing. The NRC declined to respond. Dennis Binder, law professor at Chapman University, said, The NRC's refusal to hand over the documents Boxer seeks gives the impression that somebody screwed up, and they're trying to cover up. Congress has an oversight function. The question to ask is, what are they hiding? What don't they want to come out? Hmm, I wonder. Then, Senator Boxer and David Vitter, who's a Republican senator from Louisiana, clashed heatedly on Wednesday, June 4th, during the hearing on nuclear power safety. The dust-up started when Boxer repeatedly asked NRC Chairwoman Allison McFarlane whether her agency has implemented any of the recommendations from a task force set up after the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster in Japan. McFarlane began to say that the NRC prioritized certain recommendations and some would be completed by the end of 2016, five years after the accident. But Boxer was having none of it and kept interrupting McFarlane, asking her to answer yes, no, or I don't know. Vitter interrupted, saying, Madam Chairman, we don't normally have hearings requiring the witnesses to fill in the bubble test forms. Boxer, living up to her last name, landed a one-two jab by saying, Excuse me, when you have this gavel, you make the rules. She had the gavel, so she made the rules. hoo we will have a video of Barbara Boxer, Senator Boxer, up on our website. This is a new video that has been produced by Myla Reason, one of the terrific activists here in Southern California. You'll find that link up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under episode number 155. From that same hearing with Barbara Boxer, Senator Ed Markey revealed that there's a new report yet to be published on the NRC's retaliation against those who raise safety concerns. The NRC claims to foster a safety-conscious work environment uh, where, and I quote, personnel feel free to raise safety concerns without fear of retaliation, intimidation, harassment, or discrimination. In the past year, my office has heard from an increasing number of whistleblowers from many different offices at NRC. These people are all serious, dedicated individuals who are calling my staff because they feel that they are not being heard by their own managers and colleagues. They feel that when they step forward to report safety, security, or other problems, they are systematically retaliated against. I have raised this concern many times with you. I am holding a report written by the NRC, but not yet publicly released that actually surveyed those who have attempted to use NRC's formal processes for uh, resolving policy disagreements. A staggering 75 percent of those who used them said that they received a poor performance appraisal after they raised their whistleblower concerns. Almost two-thirds of them said they were excluded from work activities by their management. 25 percent were passed over for promotions. 25 percent were even verbally abused by their colleagues and their supervisors. Uh, those results are shameful, and I ask that portions of this report be entered into the record and request your formal written response uh, for what you plan to do to fix these problems. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, and I thank you, and, and I will just say that I began chairing a committee overseeing the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in 1981. I had a hearing on site at San Onofre in 1983 on site. 
Uh, and this just continues. This whole pattern just continues at the agency, uh, and it is one that uh, it's just it's troubling because, especially post Fukushima, you know, it's very important for this culture to change, and I'm just afraid that it has not. Senator Ed Markey. The NRC's bad news continued when their officials ran into open skepticism and hostility from local residents on Wednesday night, May 28th, as they were peppered with questions about persistent operating problems at the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant, as well as future decommissioning issues. Activists brought laugh track buttons that they used whenever there was a response from William Dean, the Region 1 administrator for the NRC, as well as several others. NRC officials tried to ignore the sound effects, but then activists held up signs protesting the continued operation of Vermont Yankee. I just love the style of those activists. Many residents said they remain concerned about problems last year with faulty flood seals or seals that were not installed as Entergy Nuclear had told the NRC. Entergy traced the problem to miscommunication. What we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> Activists focused on a statement by Dean that 15 to 18 months after Vermont Yankee shuts down, the reactor's spent fuel pool could lose its water with no serious ramifications. <laughs> Activist Hattie Nessel said the NRC was not telling residents the truth. We are not fools, Nessel said. We do not buy it. Dean answered, I appreciate your freedom of expression, but said he found Nessel's comments very insulting. And went on to say, we take very seriously our role to assure the safety of the public around Yankee. That is our mission, and we are dedicated to that mission. To which the activists responded, <laughs> I gotta get me one of those. And the bad news wasn't over for the NRC because they discovered elevated levels of radioactive water in two wells underneath the Indian Point nuclear power plant in New York, just 25 miles from downtown Manhattan. The spike was detected in April after the reactor for Unit 2 was shut down for refueling. NRC officials say that the prime suspect is a canal that is flooded to remove used fuel rods to the cooling pool. A previous leak was blamed on a faulty weld in the metal lining of that canal. Someone else might have said the dog ate it. Of course, both the NRC and its evil twin energy contend that there is no immediate threat to the public. <laughs> While critics say that the fact that there may be a leak in an area where there was previously a leak shows that Indian Point is aging and systems are failing. The NRC is currently considering Entergy's application for a 20-year renewal of its licenses for both Indian Point Units 2 and 3. <laughs> okay, I've got that out of my system now. And the Alliance to Halt Fermi 3, a union of concerned citizens and 15 Southeast Michigan organizations opposed to the construction and operation of a third Fermi nuclear reactor near Monroe, Michigan, announced Phase 2 of their paid media and public outreach campaign for summer and fall 2014. They've got a new billboard campaign that's going up. It's going to be directly in alignment with the MGM Grand Casino, as well as owner-operator DTE Energy Headquarters. We'll have a picture up on our website. Workers in the Tri-Cities, Washington area, got notice on Wednesday of tinder dry conditions at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation and were advised to practice fire safety at work and at home. Ya think? Fire forecasters across the region are warning of very dry conditions ripe for winds, lightning, and human folly. This raises the specter of the 2011 Los Conchas fire, which threatened Los Alamos National Laboratory, and this year's fire at Camp Pendleton, which came within half a mile of San Onofre on the coast of Southern California. Hanford also received a drubbing from ACE reporter Susanna Frame of King 5 News in Seattle, 
focusing attention on how the Department of Energy and private companies working on the nuclear waste cleanup site treat workers after they have been injured. This is especially important in light of the fact that 28 workers have required medical care in a six-week period in March and April of this year after breathing toxic vapors from the Hanford tank farms. We will have a link to that report. Over to Japan, where officials with TEPCO say the water level inside the number two reactor's containment vessel is about half what they had estimated. They believe it is leaking from the bottom of the containment vessel, but do not know exactly from where. Nothing is known about the condition of the melted fuel in all three reactors. Mark Willisey, a correspondent with ABC Radio Australia, quoted TEPCO as saying, We think one's eaten through about a meter of the concrete containment vessel, but we can't be sure. Arnie Gunderson, a veteran nuclear engineer and director of Fairwinds Energy Education, one nuclear expert the TEPCO doesn't want to hear from, said, The site is going to bleed into the ocean for a hundred years. They have contaminated the entire groundwater underneath the site, and eventually all of that water will move into the Pacific. Willisey added, This is the greatest nuclear contamination of the ocean in history. The amount released into the ocean can't be quantified. It's incredible amounts. Yuri Kagiyama, an AP reporter in Japan, said, People are worried about getting sick. And there are really people getting sick, including thyroid cancer, which is what happened after Chernobyl. The fear keeps building. The distrust keeps building. And the people are still there living every day with that uncertainty. I wish there were more interest because the people of Fukushima are extremely worried about being forgotten. It's probably the biggest story of my life, and I've been with AP for more than 20 years. I think it's up to the reporters to make sure this important story is not forgotten. This item from our friend Iori Mochizuki, who writes the amazing blog, Fukushima Diary. He said that in seven prefectures in the north of Japan, the Kanto district, cesium-137 and 134 were detected in used diapers from 37 of 100 infants, that's more than one-third of them. In 2011, breast milk from 356 mothers was tested, and 29 of them showed measurable amounts of cesium-134 and 137. According to Mochizuki, apparently radioactive material from Fukushima Daiichi was taken into infants' bodies through breast milk. Surprise! In a report that Japan submitted to the International Atomic Energy Agency in 2012 and 2013, it failed to mention having about 640 kilograms, that's 1,411 pounds, of unused weapons-grade plutonium, enough to make about 80 nuclear bombs. The material was found in an offline reactor in a nuclear plant in Saga Prefecture in the southern Japanese town of Genkai. Gee, it just got stuck in the back of the pantry, and we forgot about it. You know how that goes. And if that's not bad enough, here's this week's... Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, None that's out of week. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, and that's an oxymoron right there, has released a preliminary report that they say shows that a severe accident at a nuclear power plant, one that releases a large amount of radiation beyond the plant, would not measurably increase the risk of most cancers. According to this draft federal report, the only result attributable to the accident would be an increase in the risk of childhood thyroid cancer, and then they add, a cancer that has a low baseline incidence rate as well as a high survival rate if contracted. This is beyond liar, liar, pants on fire. It flies in the face of everything we know about radiation's impact on the human body. The one thing that is guaranteed is that it can and will create cancer. 
But Neil Kelly, spokesmodel for Ontario Power Generation, which operates the Darlington Nuclear Facility, said the company had worked with the Safety Commission as it did the report. <laughs> I'm sure you did, Neil, baby. Luckily, Canada has Gordon Edwards, who heads the Canadian Association for Nuclear Responsibility. He said, when they say there are no attributable health effects, they're not saying there won't be health effects. They're just saying you can't prove we did it. Edwards also noted that the report doesn't discuss the economic impact of a severe accident with mass evacuation, contaminated property, and economic disruption. Oh, that. And that's why the Canadian Nuclear Safety, put that in quotes, commission is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. By the way, if any of you has a connection to Gordon Edwards, I would love to interview the man. Nuclear Hot Seat continues to reach out to people around the world, especially in Japan with our Voices from Japan series, which will continue in just a moment. With our increasing audience comes increasing bandwidth charges to support all of the downloads, plus website charges and a whole slew of expenses that must be met to keep this program running. If you've donated to help us before, many thanks and ongoing gratitude. If you haven't yet donated, or if you'd like to help out again, just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red Donate button. Your assistance will go directly to helping me help you keep up to date on all things anti-nuclear. Whatever you can do to help, many thanks. This week, as I said, we again feature voices from Japan, and we're talking with Laura and Gichi Inoue, who together run Komuro Homestay, a program which sponsors families with small children to come to the relative safety of the Komuro Nagano region to have a little bit of normalcy. They joined Nuclear Hot Seat via Skype from Japan, and apologies for those areas of the recording where Skype becomes, well, Skypish. Laura and Gichi Inoue? Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Nice to be here. Nice to be here, yes. First of all, where do you live in Japan in relationship to Fukushima? We are four or five hours drive from uh, Fukushima. Distance is one of the key factors. But the other factor is that we are in the middle of mountain, high mountains, so that According to that uh, study of Chernobyl's case, that the radiation doesn't go over the mountain. So that we first predicted that uh, our place is much safer than around in Fukushima, including Tokyo. So that we started this program. When okay. did you first become aware of the impact of the earthquake and tsunami on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant? And what was your immediate response? First, that um, these broadcasted on the news. As it was, was happening. Yes. Actually, that I studied some of the nuclear fusion when I was in university, so that I could tell that um, can happen. A certain risk was there, and especially that, according to my business experience, that a big organization like TEPCO or the government, they are very slow in decision making and so on so that I was alerted the way they dealt with this accident. And Laura, yes. how was the impact on you and what was your immediate response as you became aware of the problem with the nuclear reactor and through Geechee's response, what you knew was going to be happening for the people? Well, my response was really filtered through Gucci because he had the knowledge both of matters nuclear and of the insides of big businesses and how they managed or mismanaged things. And together we became immediately aware that the consequences of this could be very, very bad. And as the weeks unfolded, we were proved to be unfortunately right. I felt, rather than <laughs> logically thinking, that uh, I felt in front of you that often if you be in that uh, the site of the fire and then the house is burning and then inside the house, burning a house, some children or families are there, then you cannot stay or stand by. You, get, you try to you, get them out. You, you, you just want to do something. That's the first very strong urge. 
of that uh, my feeling to do something rather than just stand by and then on lookouts. How did you determine that you were going to focus on the needs of mothers and children to mm-hmm. get out of the radiation zone? How quickly did that concept come up and what did you do to start working on it? There are two holes. One is that because I was working in that's a big company and then that's a, their nature of slow decision making and then that's a not decide properly and they're not ready to take responsibility. So that, that is a human risk. And then that's a, I could tell that ordinary weak people, especially the weakest children, could be that victim or the result of this big organization slowness and so on. So that we decided, I decided to take care of them or do something to them. Because that's a, most of that's a big organization, including local government. It's the last thing they think about. Well, the last thing they think about are the powerless. Yes. What actions did you take to facilitate an outreach to the mothers and children of Fukushima? And how much participation was there by others in Komoro to do mm-hmm. this with you? We knew some of that um, volunteer group, three or four in our neighbors, so that I just proposed to form this volunteer group to support and help these families. And then they agreed upon. And then that many people felt in energy of doing something. Three or four local volunteers, activists around us, I asked to form this volunteer group to start with, and then they agreed. And then also we asked local church priest who is running the the kindergarten to join in to this volunteer group, and then they all agreed. So that's that's how we started. That was three days after this uh, massive fallout of that radiation occurred. So this started virtually while the disaster was still unfolding at its worst. Yes. Laura, how yes. did you reach out to the mothers and children in Fukushima to let them know that you were going to be offering them a place to come and stay, at least temporarily, to get out of the radiation zone? We were fumbling. We didn't really know how to do this, but we started through acquaintances and networks other people uh, had and they didn't didn't work very well but what worked in the end were websites aimed at young mothers and so Gigi put the information on one or two websites like this and the responses came pouring in more than, or more than we could cope with yes first the end of march and the april may we tried to use this anti-nuclear activist channel that one thing. Within a week after we formed this group, uh, one of that um, a group member found three guest house empty, so that we can use that for the, the homestay facilities. So that after that, we sent all this notice at the beginning of April to first anti-nuclear activist channel, and then second, we tried to use that church channel from Komoro Church to, to Date City and then Fukushima City. But that didn't work because the actual ordinary mothers, not within these channels, maybe that the local priest didn't know how to pass this information to ordinary families and the mothers who were struggling. Fortunately, we found a website of the mothers who are exchanging all this information and their opinions. Two sides. I put this onto home stay program and then that's a um, possibility. And then within a half a day, we've got 130 applicants. Wow. With getting this overwhelming number of applicants, yeah. how did you move forward to process and bring mothers and children to Comoro to stay? Yeah. How is the program actually set up? In the end, 22 families, 44 children in total over the summer holidays, we could manage. 
and then we prioritize that uh, these applicants and then that uh, around the area where most of the uh, contaminated area to start with and uh, also that the uh, age of children small babies are more dangerous so that unfortunately we only accepted 22 it was heartrending to have to select people and yes. i'll never forget the evening when all the applicants first applications were flooding in they first rang this actually was a Methodist minister and he couldn't cope with the telephone calls. They were just coming, 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 coming. And many of the callers were in tears yes. and could barely speak. Anyway, finally it settled down and we selected these people who came. And we, one other thing we did was to put, to prioritize during the summer holidays, those with school aged children and the smaller ones where there were no school-aged children could come after the holidays were yes. over. Yes. Because they w weren't bound by school terms. Yes. And this was the stage when they just had to get away. We they weren't thinking about settling anywhere or, or, or anything for the future. It was just the immediate few weeks. First notice was for the summer holiday, but also we extended this scheme and then that, uh, even after the, the summer holidays. That first year, we didn't restrict the stay period only for the summer holiday. We extended the some facility for two families to stay nearly half a year. Within that time, they could find somewhere to move out. Seven families out of 22 who came to homestay over the summer holiday, these seven families moved out and then we helped them to find the house in Komoro and in Nagano cities and so on. We here in the West do not necessarily understand Japanese culture well enough to understand the pressures faced and still being faced by families in Fukushima. What were and are some of the stresses on the mothers and children? There are three major stress and then that uh, issues they had. One is that fear to let the children play outside and then touch anything outside. So when they came to that home stay, even that uh, small children around three or four years old just ask mothers everything. Can I touch this sand? Can I touch this flowers? And then so on. So that uh, that's quite a natural thing for the small children. That's one of uh, that. Uh, stress and then also another thing is that the lack of proper information once this information comes out it's too late like that how much contamination was in that water for instance they found out later that they were there waiting for that water with the children outside with that, all these contaminated uh, air after they found all this what happened with the delayed information. There is very, very strong regret by finding out what happened to them and them for their children. One family that used uh, the bottled water, very expensive, to wash everything because mm -hmm. that they fear the tap water. They, she used uh, without knowing that how much contamination was in there and then let the children drink and then news. And then ever after she found out that delayed information, how much it was contaminated, then she had a very strong regret. And then even if that it you know, went back to normal, that she never touches that tap water. That's sort of that kind of a mental and the stress. And at the same time, that not to be able to talk about this worry and their health and so on. I understand that there was a tremendous yes. amount of repression that yes. people were not supposed to raise the issue and still are not supposed to raise the issue of yes. radiation as relates to their health, be it nosebleeds or fatigue yes. or the other yes. issues yes. that are coming about with people's health, that they're not supposed to yes. talk about it at all. Yeah, yeah. Even these mothers who came to homestay for that first summer, most of them didn't tell neighbors and then relatives they were joining to this, came to 
Nagano, uh, Komoro. They're afraid of being, how to say, <laughs> criticized or the, the traitor or something. So that was the atmosphere. So they were not even supposed to admit that there was any risk as opposed to the fact yeah. that they were taking actions to try and mitigate yeah. the risk that they were, that they yeah. were literally yeah. under. Yeah. They were not talking about this uh, risk with the neighbors. And then that, uh, even that some of the neighbors are telling these mothers that everything is okay. But looking out at outside, no children was playing outside, even if they're not talking about it. Inside their mind, they're worrying about, but cannot speak out. Laura, you wrote in one of our communications that in Fukushima there is a conspiracy of silence. What did you mean by that? That was immediately after the accident, and one of the applicants who actually never came, it was her seven-year-old who just naturally in class, as children do, were talking about going to Comoro, and the teacher picked her out and told her in front of the class that she was a traitor. A traitor? A traitor. So you, he used the word in Japanese for traitor. It's appalling. I mean, we were deeply shocked by that. Simply because they were going to Komoro to get out of the radiation for a period of time. Yes, you have to stick in Fukushima and support it. Otherwise, chickening out is treachery. And there seems to have been no attempt mentally to distinguish between sticking together and rebuilding after the earthquake and tsunami, which is realistic, and how you deal with radiation. And the only response to that is to flee. It's quite different. Some people didn't understand. Some people deliberately didn't understand. And there was guidance issued by the Ministry of Education to teachers as to how to deal with this. And, and there it did not include encouraging people to flee. I also understand that there were pressures brought against mothers who were trying to buy safe food and that people were encouraged to trust the government reassurances as opposed yes. to questioning them. Yes. Ministry of Education issued some handbook for the school teachers and then headmasters in that education area. And then in that handbook, they put rather than radiation and then their risk, they put that mental stress can be more harmful for the, uh, the people. If the uh, parents are worrying too much, that may affect children's mental condition. So don't worry too much or don't talk about much of that worry. And then that is guidance or handbook to the teachers. So that it's a somehow that quite calculated way to create the atmosphere, not to be able to speak or talk about worry, even among parents. Explain for listeners the concept of gaman. It's one of the first words you learn as a foreigner coming to Japan. It means putting up with things, basically, just putting up with things and persevering. And it doesn't really include trying to do something about the cause of your distress or worry. In other words, just put up with it. Just put up with it and carry on, yes. So what kind of education did you share with the mothers before they returned with their families to Fukushima, at least the families that did return there? The purpose for this education or, or study session with mothers, especially those who came to homestay. We saw that it's very important to share this risk and then that uh, to think, discuss together all this risk. Also that the fact they can do wherever they are to save the children for a long time, that the mothers and the families need to take certain actions rather than us just prepare that homestay place and so on. The purpose of this education or the study is for the mothers especially to take everyday action or management to reduce this risk by radiation and then radiation exposure. Some families need to stay in Fukushima who, who cannot move out 
but they can do something to reduce the risk. First year was external exposure because radioactive contamination is very high outside after the massive fallout. So we studied the impact of external exposure to the children's health in form of the cancer and leukemia and so on. But next year, these settled down a little bit, but this uh, radiation came into eco cycle and the food chain so that we started to talk about and think about this radioactive contamination comes through that the food and the internal exposure. Well, what Gigi has been doing for the last, in fact, more than the last few weeks, but it's become more intense than the last few weeks, is to go through government Ministry of Agriculture data from the last three years. There's now plenty to compare. In fact, there's umpteen thousand bits of data and try and compile a program so that mothers can look at it and say, say, look up the cabbages from a certain prefecture. How do the safe ones differ from the more dangerous ones? By how many becquerels? How many, if I'm looking at that pile of cabbages in the supermarket, what proportion of them are likely to be contaminated? Because they all look the same. In other words, how to choose not necessarily completely safe food, but food that's as safe as you can get day by day. We have to eat something, even if it's not 100% satisfactory. And I understand that the authorities in testing the cabbages come up with an average becquerel count, which can be wildly different from cabbage to cabbage. But they go by safety by saying that there is an average becquerel count that we will consider to be okay. Yes. And then that's uh, actually... That the government issued all this data, and then that the average is quite similar. But what they are doing is set certain criteria too high for the children's health point of view. That's 100 becquerel per kilogram is too high. Almost any of these uh, radiated food come into the market. In that situation, that uh, mothers need to choose which one. If they have some choices, then they have to choose a safer one, less contaminated one, or the less risky one. But that information is completely missing. And then the government is just issued the numbers. It's not useful data for mothers for that everyday life. And then they, they cannot make use of all of this data. And one of the most horrifying and angering things that I read in your story and some of the materials you sent to me is that you've heard the experts say that what Fukushima was experiencing would provide good data. In other words, it was okay for the people to be going through this because the scientists and the statisticians would have some numbers on the other Mm. side, paying no attention to the quality of life and the damage to life that was going on. They're talking about from scientific point of view or the expert point of view. Unless you statistically set up some relation or dependency of that this disease or illness, unless they prove that, they're saying it's okay because no proof of that so this causes leukemia or something. That is one expert way of talking about this. But in this Fukushima case, nobody can tell the risk that uh, what will happen in 10 years' time, especially that the low-dose, long-term impact of the radiation exposure, internal, external, to babies and children who grow up in maybe the, in 10 years' time, that the high school boys or girls. At least if you identify certain risk, and then you can choose less risky one. And then that's another way to look at. But uh, this government and the expert doesn't provide any of that guidance. Let's get back to the program that you have been running. We're now coming into our fourth summer since Fukushima happened. Actually, we've stopped counting. There were the original 22 families. Then there are others who've joined since. I think it may be about 30 No, 33. 33, okay, you've been counting. And we very much keep up with them. We keep networking. 
they really still need support. And we also have a program whereby during the growing season, we send safe vegetables from here, which they can buy at a reasonable price. They had been, many of them had been ordering from way down south from Kyushu and Okinawa, and it costs a fortune. So we have somebody here who is picking up, the, you know, the bendy cucumbers you can't send to the supermarket, but which taste great, and sending people boxes. So we're doing that. And I think the networking is almost the most important thing with the people who've moved here, with the people who haven't and who perhaps can come for the odd weekend, and keeping up the discussion. They can't discuss with their neighbours, but they can discuss with us. And then Geechee will provide them with any new information or guidance that he can come up with. What are some of the long-term social pressures that have been showing up in families that are under the pressure of having been in and still being in Fukushima and exposed to the radiation as well as the propaganda? I think that when we see things in our 33 families, we can take it for granted that they are representatives, tips of the iceberg, and there's lots more of the same going on. There was, for example, one family who came here, and they were on the verge of divorce several times because the husband said the company says everything's all right, everything's all right, you're just a religious group, which we're not, and he wanted his wife to have nothing more to do with us, she was dithering because she wanted her little boys to have a father, and she didn't really want to get divorced, but she was also very worried about their health. And it was awful. And when she first came, I'll never forget her attitude, her face. She was like a taut rubber band. She, it was as though she was about to break. Their problems have, I think, been solved because his company sent him to a much safer area, so they're all now living there. But we're in regular contact. There are lots of pressures, not just from husbands, but from older relatives. There's one family who really wanted to settle here, but couldn't mainly because the older generation refused to let them go and they needed taken care of. All sorts of things that never would have arisen had it not been for the accident. Then there are worries into the future. This is a very Japanese kind of worry that the children who were exposed to radiation would not be able to get married. You know, there was a terrific difficulty in victims of Nagasaki and Hiroshima getting married because of the fear of genetic defect. And now this is carrying over to those children who have been impacted by Fukushima Daiichi. Yes, yes. I mean, the five -year, average five-year-olds not worrying about that, but their parents and grandparents are. Where are you now? with the Comoro Homestay Program. And is there a way that listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat would be able to support you in your ongoing work? This is fourth year now. A new family whose children or baby is born after the accident. New generation, second generation coming now. But at the same time, some families who evacuated and then that um, lived some other places for three years. But their financial support by the local government and so on, that the financial support was stopped so that uh, some of the families need to go back to their hometown. And then that uh, their pressure or stress is now coming back so that more mental support for the mothers in that uh, everyday life now, but uh, we need to figure out what they can do in that everyday life wherever they are. Mm -hmm. And then we, we need to support that. I corrected the data of that, this food contamination and then that uh, for everyday shopping and then everyday food, which is uh, less risky, they can choose. This for some a uh, little bit more useful information form we are preparing and then send it as a newsletter. What is missing now is that this everyday life risk management. And then 
especially long-term risk for children. Uh, the health is not well discussed. To do that, first we need to identify the risk of that, this long-term exposure. And then how to measure the risk, and I started to measure this food contamination and so on. And then can tell a little bit of differences in numbers. But uh, this completely missing part is that how to evaluate these differences to the children's health in the future. Not much information about that is available as far as I studied. So that if somebody in that nuclear hot seat members know about these long term and then that these internal exposure or that um, everyday life health management in that situation like that you in the United States had some experience in this situation. If you know somebody who is listening to this program, know about this data or that some experience, then that, uh, uh, we are most welcome to get all this information so that we can tell that mothers that uh, what is the risk of everyday life and then that how that uh, this risk may affect children in the future uh, health and so on. And how to manage it. How to manage it. It's We'd be very, important. very grateful. Yes. What would be the contact information for them to reach out directly to you? Please contact through me on my Gmail email address, which is Laura Jane, all one word, 713 at gmail.com. I expect that you will be hearing from many of the members, many of the listeners to this program, because there are people who are working specifically on the radiation and food issue. I have a few connections myself, including Kimberly Roberson of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, and I'll contact you offline with some of the things that we've been learning and that we've started sharing in trainings that we are putting Thank together you. dealing with right. radiation. In closing, is there anything you would like to say that perhaps we have not covered that you would like to mention to our listeners? Please don't forget us. Don't forget us. We're all one. The, your listeners may not understand the Japanese language, but feel yourselves in contact. We're all one worldwide community fighting the effects of nuclear power and its twin brother, nuclear weapons, the people who run it, I'm afraid, because so many of the failures are human. And what I intend to do, and I'm not sure how quickly I can do it, but certainly within the next month or two, is to write an update to my article with a lot of the latest news in it, how we're getting on. And I will find some way to make that freely available. Well, you can certainly send it to us at Nuclear Hot Seat, and I will post it prominently on my website and get it to other websites that are dealing with the radiation issue that will have direct interest in what it is you have to say. Thank you, Libby. Thank you. Doing what I can. Can I just say one more thing that's come to Absol mind? Absolutely. Go ahead. I want to say thank you to all the mothers and children for coming. We've had such fun. Yes. And the children are so sparkling. Our hope and prayer is they're not squashed in the education system. If they get through the education system fine, Japan will be fine. They're great. Thank you both so much for the important work that you are doing, for the help and the hope that you are giving to specifically the mothers and children of Fukushima, and especially for being willing to make yourselves available for this interview on Nuclear Hot Seat. Laura and Gichi Inoue. Again, for those of you who wish to contact them with practical information on radiation and how to protect against it, send an email to laurajane713 at gmail.com. When we have a link to her updated article on the situation being faced by the Komoro homestay families and all the rest in Fukushima, we will post that as well. So what does it mean to find yourself accidentally next to a nuclear reactor when it happens to be leaking? That's my personal story, and I'm sticking with it. And I tell it in my nuclear memoir, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, 
one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. It's available as an e-book on Amazon Kindle. Fingers crossed it will be published as a book book before the end of the year. You can check out a free excerpt by going to the website, nuclearhotseat.com. Look for the big yellow box and put in your first name and email address. You will get a PDF from the chapter that takes me from landing at the Harrisburg Airport five days before the nuclear accident began to being trapped in my friend's house after evacuation was announced via bullhorn in the middle of the street. Or just go to Amazon and buy it. Kindle books can be read on any digital device. And by making the purchase, you will be supporting me in the work that I do with Nuclear Hot Seat. Hey, John Stewart, did you hear Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me on May 31st? That's the NPR News Quiz, and they featured an item on the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, and the plutonium leak on their program. They are beating you to the punch, John, and they're only on once a week. What's your excuse? Time you picked up the ball, booby. Nuclear is a topic ripe for satire. It's heating up, and you don't want to be left behind. The Daily Show needs me. I am your nuclear pundit. Call. Let's talk. And here's today's final thought. No one in our community is happy over the use of Farrell Williams' smash hit song of that name as a front for Fukushima. Well, maybe that highly paid social media bitch Judas who set the whole thing up is happy with it, but the rest of us aren't. I will have more on this story next week. But know that it shows that what we need to do is produce our own compelling, entertaining media to tell the true story of what's happening at Fukushima, at the WIP site, and all the corners of the nuclear propaganda war that is fighting against sanity and logic and reason and truth. We need artwork, cartoons, whiteboard illustrations, films, videos, songs. Crochet us an Afghan with the nuclear symbol on it. We need an anti-nuclear pop cultural revolution. What are your best ideas? Well, let me know what they are. Send them to info at nuclearhotseat.com, and in the future I will share the best of them on this show. In closing, this has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 10, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, ocregister.com, thehill.com, recorder.com, westchester.news12.com, nofermay3.com, nwnewsnetwork.com, King 5 News in Seattle, and ace investigative reporter Susanna Frame, NHK World, ABC Radio Australia, WBUR Boston, Radio VR, Fukushima Diary and our friend Iori Mochizuki, thestar.com, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Please stop by, say hello, click that like button. Voices from Japan is a co-production of Nuclear Hot Seat and the Families for Safe Energy team. My esteemed co-producer for the series is Beverly Findlay Kaneko. Thanks to Scott Portsline of TMI Alert for the Senator Ed Markey audio clip. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. We're now on three times a week, including a flashback random replay on Tuesdays. We are also on airamerica.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts, or you can check us out on the newly searchable website, nuclearhotseat.com. Go to the blog page. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed for nonprofit use. You have my permission to reuse as long as proper attribution, website, and email are included. If you're for profit, I'm reasonable. Let's negotiate. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. <laughs>